Hello and welcome to topic six, lecture one. And in this lecture, we're gonna look at contraceptive policy. So to this week we start topic six and it's the first policy exploration that we begin. Yay, finally we get here. So up to this point, we've been doing some foundational work, which is really important for understanding public policy as we move forward. And so, but now we begin the process of actually looking at specific public policy areas. Um, this is the last topic that we're gonna cover before the midterm exam. Um, the midterm exam, you'll receive it at the end of this week on Wednesday, October 26, you'll receive the exam. There's also a study session, a Zoom study session that you can attend. Um, and if you can't attend it, then uh, it'll be recorded so you can watch it on your own time. And then the exam is due on Tuesday, November 1st. I did change the due date for that exam just to give you some more time. So make sure that you're looking on Canvas um, to get some more information about the exam as we move towards that after this week. So this week we're gonna examine the public debates and the policies associated with reproduction. And reproduction has two sort of big issue areas. One is contraception, that is ways in which pregnancy can be prevented. And the other big issue area is abortion. Um, terminating a pregnancy once it happens. Um, those aren't the only uh, policy issue areas associated with reproduction. There are many other issue areas as well, but these are the ones that we're going to focus on. Lecture one, this one, we're gonna look at contraceptive policy. And in the next lecture, we're gonna look at abortion policy. So let's go ahead and get started. So as you're gonna learn this week, since the 1960s and, and 70s, until just recently with the overturning of Roe v. Wade, uh, people have had the tools to manage and control their reproduction. Uh, in other words, uh, that people could have sex with, um, with delinked from reproduction. Um, that given the multiple birth control methods, the pill, very, most of which it can be very reliable, and also access to abortion as a constitutional right, um, that when people had sex, that they could have it for reasons other than um, reproducing. And in fact, you could have sex for pleasure um, because you could control your reproduction and that you didn't have to worry necessarily about the um, getting pregnant as a, as a result of, um, uh, of sexual activities um, or, or intercourse in particular. Um, so 19th century feminists referred to this control over reproduction as voluntary motherhood. Uh, and they regarded voluntary motherhood as essential for women achieving freedom and equality. Um, you know, voluntary motherhood is this idea that women bring themselves to being mothers. They choose to become pregnant. Um, and they also can control uh, not you know, becoming a mother, right? That they can have control over that. Um, today, you know, we talk about that not as voluntary motherhood, but as planned parenthood, right? Um, that you plan when you want to become a parent. And that's true for women and for men uh, in relationships. You know, you can use um, uh, technology in order to plan when you want your pregnancies to be for the most part, right? And for the 19th century feminists, they really saw this as essential for women achieving freedom and equality. Um, that it's difficult to, um, you know, pursue your dreams, to go to school, to get a job that you want, if there's a lot of uncertainty regarding uh, um, uh, whether or not you're going to get pregnant. So. But realizing, so this is this idea of voluntary motherhood has been around, you know, since uh, the 1800s. But realizing voluntary motherhood, realizing this control over reproduction, is a relatively new phenomenon. For most of American history, you know, released prior to the 1960s, uh, women and families had little, little reliable and safe control over reproduction. And as I was preparing my lectures for today, these are my first sets of lectures post Dobbs. You know, I'm realizing that we may be entering an, an era of not voluntary motherhood or voluntary parenthood, but involuntary motherhood, involuntary parenthood. And so we may be entering uh, an era, most, we are entering an era um, of diminished control over reproductive freedom. So your textbook identifies three phases of public policy that reflect how contraception is defined by society. And because of recent changes, I've added a fourth phase, which we'll talk about just briefly in the lecture. 
Phase one is contraception is viewed as obscene material by public policy. Phase two, contraception as a preventative treatment of disease. Phase three, contraception as tool for family planning, personal choice, and phase four, potential erosion of constitutional protection of right to contraceptives. So let's look, take a look at these phases. So prior to the 19th century, and so that'd be prior to the 1800s, that contraception was viewed as a private matter. In other words, it wasn't viewed as a realm for public policymakers or lawmakers to get involved. Um, contraception and the use of contraceptives was practiced as it has been for most of human history, if not all of human history, but it wasn't seen as a matter of public debate or policy. And that was in large part to what we've talked about in the past, this idea of separate spheres, right? That women possessed a, a certain sphere, and that was the family, the, uh, the sphere of family, home, and the private realm. And men were involved in the public realm, right? And so not that the public realm didn't get involved in some aspects of the private realm. I mean, for example, in marriage where women lost their legal identity uh, when they got married. I mean, clearly that was an entry into the, 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 pub, the private realm. Um, but, you know, most sort of, you know, matters of sexuality or reproduction sort of left to something or uh, an arena that public lawmakers didn't get involved in. Um, that does, like I said, it doesn't mean that uh, uh, contraceptives weren't practiced and used. Of course they were, that, that there's a long history of um, sort of home methods of contraceptives, uh, whether that's, um, you know, herbal washes uh, or, or, or of the vaginal area after sex that would um, be seen as sort of a spermic having a spermicidal impact. Um, barriers, uh, cotton wrapped in honey that would serve as a, a barrier to the, um, in the, to the cervix. Uh, the rhythm method, uh, you know, monitoring ones uh, when people felt that they were uh, uh, fertile or, or uh, a coitus interruptus, right? Uh, all, all of those were uh, methods that were practiced, uh, but clearly outside of the, the realm of public uh, control. This changes in the, in the 1830s, okay? Um, and so uh, at the beginning part of the 19th century, uh, that there's growing concern about the access and distribution of, of contraceptives. And this is in part due to what was known as the rubber revolution, which is kind of like a, it, that has a double meaning um, that we, you know, condoms are sometimes referred to as rubber. They're not made out of rubber anymore. Unless latex is rubber, rubber maybe it is, I'm not sure. Um, but that, uh, you know, uh, uh, sheaths uh, used as condoms from, you know, animal skins, you know, those those were used, but they, they weren't very reliable prior to the 1830s. Um, but Charles Goodyear, uh, a chemist, uh, that he came up with a method of what was known as vulcanizing rubber, changing rubber so that it was more durable and that it could be mass produced. And that that invention led to um, the easier access and the mass production of contraceptives. So not only did it make rubber condoms easier to access and easier to produce, but um, uh, uh, diaphragms became easier to, you know, have access to and other um, uh, types of uh, contraceptives that utilized this vulcanized rubber um, were used. And yes, if that name sounds familiar, Charles Goodyear, Goodyear, he wasn't the founder of the Goodyear Tire Company, but when that tire company was formed, they named it after Charles Goodyear. So we have this rise of the use of, of contraceptives at, at the early part of the 19th century. It's in the mid 19th century and around the 1860s that contraception begins to enter the public debate. And the driving force behind making concept, contraceptives a public issue is Anthony Comstock, who is pictured there. So who's Anthony Comstock? Well, Anthony Comstock uh, was born in 1844. Um, he was raised as a strict Puritan, very religious upbringing. Uh, he fought in the Civil War. And then after the Civil War, he took a job in New York City. And when he was in New York City in the, in, in the 19, uh, or I'm sorry, the 1860s, the mid 1860s, 
um, he began to see what life was like in New York City. Uh, he was confronted with gambling halls and saloons and easy access to pornography and um, brothels and prostitution. And he was just appalled by what he saw as the moral degradation of America. And he really thought that this uh, uh, moral degradation degradation uh, was brought on by access to pornography, um, being able to engage in sexual pleasure because you had access to contraceptives, um, and that he was really, really um, concerned about this. And also for him, it was personal. Like I said, he was re re raised religiously devout, but in his own writings, he talks about his own sexual desires, um, and that he says that he is, uh, I'm not making this up, that he views himself as sort of a compulsive masturbate and that he feels like this this dark side of him is really brought out by um, having access to pornography and having access to brothels. And so he really wanted to bring all of that to an end. And so he gets involved in politics. Um, he joins the uh, YMCA, the Young Men's Christian Association, and he works with them to bring about and create anti-vice commissions within the city of New York, drawing attention to all the vice that's going on. He also, as it says here, he begins to lobby Congress to do something about this, to do something about this problem, right? So Anthony Consop, he's a problem identifier. He's an agenda setter. He's like, ah, oh, there's this problem. Uh, there's all this moral degrading lewdness going on in these sittings. And the reason that it's going on in these in these cities is because people have access to contraceptives and information about contraceptives and pornography and brothels and we've got to do something about it so he lobbies congress to pass a law criminalizing the importation and distribution of obscene materials and that included information and and uh, about contraceptives and actually contraceptives themselves. So I want you also to just think about the mindset too at this time that, you know, when you get contraceptives, it has a pamphlet, at least back in the day, and even today to a certain degree, showing you how to use it, how to insert it, how it should be used, right? And that, you know, that seeing that information was seen as sort of like obscene, sexually provocative. And so that was what he wanted Congress to take action on that. So the first contraceptive policy in the United States is known as the Comstock Act, named after Anthony Comstock. And it defines contraceptives as an obscene and illicit material, making it a federal offense to disseminate birth control through the mail or across state lines. Um, and so uh, that this is a federal law. And so the federal government has control over importation of um, uh, items into the United States. And so the importation of contraceptives from other countries was prohibited. Uh, you could not use the mail to distribute contraceptives and information about contraceptives um, because the United States has control over the Postal Service. And you can't distribute them or uh, between uh, state lines. You can't cross state lines and, um, you know, basically, um, you know, deliver any sort of contraceptives uh, between state lines um, because the United States government has control over interstate commerce, okay? And so this was a you know, really comprehensive law that had an impact not just on um, uh, contraceptives, but had uh, impact on, uh, on any items that were regarded as obscene and Ill illicit. They were known as the chastity laws because we were trying to bring social purity back to the United States by uh, prohibiting the um, uh, distribution of these sorts of items. Now, this is a federal law, so it, it was it was limited in terms of it, its reach, right? You, you couldn't send things through the mail. You couldn't um, transport it between states. You couldn't import uh, contraceptives into the United States. Uh, but in within a state, uh, you could um, manufacture and... Uh, distribute uh, contraceptives because what happens in the state is not the jurisdiction, at least not at this time, of the federal government. Uh, and so states began to pass what were known as Little Comstock Acts. And these were uh, state versions of the federal law that made it a criminal offense to um, distribute contraceptives
contraceptives, to give out information about contraceptives. And so, you know, uh, the, the states followed suit with implementation of their own laws. Uh, and because of both the federal law and the, the 24 state level laws, um, access to contraceptives um, uh, became in very difficult uh, in the United States. And so the first policy is to crack down on access to contraceptives. Uh, just as a side note, uh, Anthony Comstock got a job out of this. So um, because he brought this to the attention of the United States government, they passed the law and then they gave him a commission as special agent to the U.S. Post Office because it was the post office that was in large part, um, you know, monitoring and enforcing the law since it was a federal crime to use the mail to mail contraceptives um, to uh, people in the United States. The Comstock Act made it much more difficult for people to access contraceptives and to get information about contraceptives. And that made people, some people in the United States really angry, uh, particularly women who really saw that the ability to um, you know, have control over your reproduction was really a key to becoming a more equal and free individual within the United States. And one of those people was Margaret Sanger. You might be familiar with Margaret Sanger. She is sometimes known as the, 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 the founding uh, mother of Planned Parenthood. Uh, Margaret Sanger was a, a, a nurse, uh, that she was a sex educator. She was a, a birth control activist. Uh, and for her, uh, she really was, you know, with those 19th century feminists who were basically saying, look, control of your reproduction is really key to women's liberation. And um, following the the Comstock Act, you know, she really saw and was witness as a nurse to the hardships that were associated with not choosing to become a mother, not choosing to become a, a parent. And in fact, she writes a whole book that includes letters from women who wrote her about the, the real harms that come from not having control over one's reproductive capacity. Uh, so as I stated, for saying you're control, controlling reproduction is, is really key for her to um, equality and, and freedom. Uh, she, like other feminists at this time period, she really believed that women can't achieve equality and personal autonomy within the United States if they can't plan their pregnancies. That she wanted voluntary motherhood, not involuntary motherhood. And so uh, Margaret Sanger uh, challenged the Comstock Act, uh, Comstock, uh, Act. Uh, and she did that, did that by opening the first birth control clinic in the United in the United States in 1916. And so by opening a birth control clinic, she was in complete opposition to or, or she was you know uh, offending uh, the Comstock Act uh, because she was basically engaging in a, a criminal act according to that law. Uh, and she was charged, convicted and sentenced of violating the Comstock Act. Um, and so uh, that she had a trial and she received a sentence of 30 days in jail. And and through the trial and the publicity that the trial got, it really drew attention to this problem of involuntary motherhood, this problem associated without, with, uh, with not having control over one's reproductive capacity. And so just as uh, Anthony Comstock was uh, identified a problem and got it on the agenda, so too did Margaret Sanger. She identified the problem of involuntary motherhood and she got it on the agenda because of of the publicity that her trial received. So Margaret Singer challenges the Comstock Act, but it's unsuccessful. Um, in fact, she's convicted and put in jail. And so she realizes that the approach that she's using to challenge the Comstock Act is not successful. That she realizes that if she wants to change the law, focusing on that having control of your reproduction is essential for women's freedom and equality, she realizes that that is not an argument that's going to get traction in, in changing public policy. And so what she does is that she shifts her perspective. And, and, and the shift in perspective that she has is that let's not focus on women, but let's focus on the right of male doctors to treat patients, okay? And it, uh, that, uh, that she says that if we can find 
medical loopholes within the Comstock Act. Basically say you can have the Comstock Act, however, we have to carve out exceptions for doctors so that they can treat patients. But if you, continue, if you find these loopholes and you carve out exceptions within the Comstock Act, that it's gonna weaken that Comstock Act. And in fact, that is an approach that was really worked quite successfully. So why is uh, the, the approach, the medical loophole approach, why is that successful to weakening the Comstock Act? Well, it's successful in part because it appealed to two powerful interests within society. Clearly one of those was doctors. You're looking for a medical loophole, a way that doctors can get an exemption from the Comstock Act. Well, doctors uh, were a powerful group at, in society at this time. In the 20th century, we begin to see the professionalization of medical doctors, the formation of the American Medical Association, and the sense that doctors should be the ones who are making decisions about their, their, their patients, not Congress. Uh, and so doctors got on board with that and were happy to lobby Congress on uh, uh, in terms of more freedom for doctors. Uh, doctors said, look, birth control can be seen as a therapeutic. Um, if a woman has a health condition that would be exacerbated by getting pregnant, then doctors should be able to um, prevent that pregnancy. If you're able to distribute uh, contraceptives, you can make money from distributing those contraceptives to your patients. And also there was money to be made in future research on contraceptives, right? Um, if, uh, you know, people use contraceptives, you get a more effective form of contraceptive like the pill, there's money that can be made. And indeed money was made in the, in the, um, in the production of the pill. Another powerful interest in society at this time were nativists or those who were against they were anti-immigrant, anti-immigration. As we know, there was a rise of immigration at the beginning of the 20th century from Eastern Europe, Southern Europe, and Northern Europe. And as those people came into the United States, there was a backlash to that, sort of similar to the backlash that we have today. There was a sense that these weren't true Americans and that the, when they would come and have a lot of babies, that it was basically um, you know, uh, uh, degrading the purity of, of the true Americans in the United States. So uh, Sanger uh, appealed to the nativist sentiment that, uh, you know, the right in order to achieve this goal of getting rid of the Constack Act. And so uh, rise of immigrants in the 20th century was viewed negatively. Hey, you want to keep the uh, immigrant population low, allow access to birth control, give birth control to immigrants, and therefore they'll stop reproducing and real Americans can reproduce and keep the, the, the population pure. I, uh, you know, uh, as you're going to see throughout the course of this semester that sometimes uh, 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 feminists like Ma Margaret Sanger will align with us, you know, a, a less than appropriate group like anti-immigrants to achieve what they see as this bigger goal of giving reproductive, uh, achieving reproductive freedom or other goals um, uh, uh, for women. And it's an example of a policy community that we talked about when we were learning about the public policy um, process that doctors and nativists formed a network of political actors who were lobbying Congress to change or make exceptions to the Comstock Act. And that there were legal challenges that arise to the Comstock Act, um, basically really weakening its impact. Um, it allowed women to get, um, it allowed women to uh, uh, use uh, birth control for therapeutic reasons, that doctors can use the mail in order to distribute uh, birth control for medical reasons. And, 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 and so you can really see that that really begins to chip away at the power of the Comstock Act. Okay, so the federal law, the Comstock Act, is greatly weakened by the efforts of Margaret Sanger and others. Um, but as we know that at the state level, there were lots of little Comstock Acts that were passed at the state level. So in many states throughout the United States, access to birth control, distribution to birth control, giving out information about birth control was still a crime. And so and this brings about the, the, the phase three that begins in really a, a, a earnest in the 1950s and the 1960s. Uh, and it's a return to Sanger's original goal, okay? That, um, that birth control, it results in freedom for women and families. And the 1960s is fertile time for this shift as we see the rise of second wave feminists and the rise of the focus on equality uh, and liberation for women. 
And uh, Planned Parenthood, uh, you know, which is, is uh, the group that develops out of the work and the groups that were formed by Margaret Sanger, uh, they're at the forefront of shifting the terms of this day, debate back to, towards liberty, privacy, and autonomy. And they achieved that goal in the landmark case, Griswold versus Connecticut from 1965. So let's look at the facts of the case, Griswold versus Connecticut. So what is the case Griswold versus Connecticut about? Well, it's about uh, challenging uh, a law that was passed in 1879 in Connecticut. Remember that we had the Federal Comstock Act, but a lot of states followed suit and passed their own state level laws. And this was one of those state level laws. And um, this law criminalized the use and distribution of contraceptives. So if you were using contraceptives, you were engaging in a crime. And if you were distributing and giving out information about contraceptives, you were also committing a crime. And so uh, people in Connecticut Connecticut, who were concerned about reproductive freedom, wanted to challenge this law. They viewed this law as being unconstitutional. And so they actually uh, set up uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Lee Buxton uh, opens a birth control clinic with Estelle Griswold, who is the director of Planned Parenthood in uh, New Haven in Connecticut. Uh, and that they open this uh, clinic in order to challenge the law. Because the only way you can figure out whether or not a law is in fact constitutional is that a person has to break the law and then you have to bring that question to the courts and hopefully, and in this case, all the way to the Supreme Court of the United States to determine whether or not that law is constitutional. And so that's what... Uh, uh, Buxton and Griswold did. And in the pictures here, you can see this is uh, Estelle Griswold. Uh, and this is Estelle Griswold and uh, the president of Planned Parenthood in the state of Connecticut, uh, that they I have the newspaper announcing the decision in Griswold versus Connecticut. Uh, and so they, uh, they, they, uh, uh, the both uh, Buxton and Griswold are convicted of, uh, uh, uh breaking the Connecticut law uh, because a married couple came to their clinic and the clinic give, gave them uh, birth control. And that is a crime in the state of Connecticut. So the question before the Supreme Court of the United States who had the final decision on this case was, does the Constitution of the United States protect the right of marital privacy against state restrictions on a couple's ability to be counseled on the use of contraceptives? And in a 7-2 decision, the Supreme Court of the United States said yes, that the Constitution does protect the right of married couples to get contraceptives. So the decision in Griswold versus Connecticut is an extraordinarily important for reproductive freedoms in the United States. Why is that? Well, it's, it's important because this case establishes privacy as a constitutionally protected right. It basically says that the Constitution has a right to privacy. And the right to privacy is basically the freedom to make certain decisions about our bodies and our private lives without the interference of governments. And so in this case, that you have a constitutional right to make private decisions about whether or not you want to use contraceptives. Um, the, this is an important case because they say not only is this right uh, in the Constitution, but it's a, it's deemed a fundamental right, a right of extraordinary importance. Uh, and so when we think about practicing our religion, exercising our religion, and engaging in freedom of speech, we deem those as incredibly important rights for a functioning and a democracy. And, and, and the decision in Griswold said that the right to privacy is uh, on par with the, the, those fundamental rights of speech and, and religious freedoms. Uh, that the right to privacy in Griswold is found in in the Bill of Rights, even though it's not explicitly stated in the Constitution. And so they basically say, look, if you look at the First Amendment and the Third Amendment and the Fifth Amendment and the Fourth Amendment and the Ninth Amendment, and you kind of combine those together, that's where the right to privacy is located. Uh, and that it's, it's the first step on the pathway of providing the framework and the constitutional protection for other cases that deal with reproduction in particular abortion. And that's what we're going to talk about in the next, um, uh, in the next uh, uh, lecture. And so Griswold provides the foundation for abortion rights, for sexual autonomy, that is making decisions about uh, two adults who they want to have sex with, same-sex marriage, and end-of-life issues as well. So it's an incredibly important case. 
So what is the next phase in contraceptive policy considering the Dobbs de decision? And the Dobbs decision, we're going to be talking about it more in the next lecture, is the decision that overturns Roe v. Wade and says that you don't have a constitutional right to an abortion. So is the next phase going to be a potential erosion of the constitutional protections of the right to contraceptives that is established in Griswold versus Connecticut? At this point, it's unclear. We're not sure what the next phase is going to look like. In the Dobbs decision written by Justice Samuel Alito, it, he specifies that, that, that there is no, const, that even though there is no constitutional right to an abortion, that, that that does not apply to other rights based on the right to privacy, such as the right to contraceptive use. Uh, and so he basically says that just because you don't have a right to an abortion doesn't mean that you don't have a constitutional right to the use, uh, to the use of contraceptives. Um, but some people are wondering, is that really the case? Uh, the right to an abortion is predicated on the constitutional right to privacy. So if the constitutional right to privacy doesn't extend to, in fact, not only does the constitutional right not extend to abortion, but the court says that there is no constitutional right to privacy, right? That that's not in the constitution, right? So it, it's, it, it leaves people to think that if the right to privacy doesn't apply to abortion because the right to privacy doesn't exist, does that mean that without the right to privacy in the constitution, do you actually have a right to use a constitutional right to use abortions. Um, now, it could very well be that you know states aren't chomping at the bit to like pass Comstact Act style laws, you know, from the eighteen from eighteen you know eighty from the eighteen eighties, right? Uh, while there is political will to criminalize abortion, uh, there's not really a political will, at least that I'm aware of, to criminalize broad and general use of contraceptives. But that being the case, that even if broadly used contraceptives such as diaphragms, condoms, the pill are left intact, uh, it could be that certain types of contraceptives that provide prevent uh, a fertilized egg from implanting in a uterus, it's potential that there might, it's possible that there might be laws passed at the state level saying that you don't, that, that, it, that, that uh, uh, certain contraceptives such as the IUD, which prevents that uh, implantation as does of a fertilized egg into the uterus as does plan B, it could be that states could uh, criminalize access, use, distribution of these types of contraceptives. But like I said, at this point, we don't know what the next phase of contraceptive policy is going to be. But if you're interested, it, it, you know, it's something that you could explore on your own and also, you know, uh, think about a potential uh, idea for a public policy paper. Okay, thanks a lot for listening and on to our next lecture, which is on abortion rights.